Hi, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We lost, uh, we lost one of our speakers. Um, if we can just wait for a couple minutes to see if she's can come back. Um, I will write her, Jennifer. Perhaps while we're waiting, I can introduce uh, the person that I so rudely skipped. Um, and that's uh, Michael Samwalian, um, who in a few minutes will be speaking about defending density. He's a founding director of the Jacobs Institute Urban Tech Hub at Cornell Tech, as you heard earlier uh, in the symposium a venture that bridges tech industries and academic research to address pressing urban challenges and public needs. He's an urban planner, real estate developer, professor, and most recently the president and CEO of the Trust for Governors Island. And prior to his appointment as pres president of the trust, Michael was a vice president with related companies where he was responsible for the planning and design of Hudson Yards. After 9-11, Michael was the director of Lower Manhattan Special Projects at the New York City Department of City Planning, helping the, city, helping the city's efforts to redevelop downtown. I'm gonna pause here and see if our speaker has returned. Dr. I sure. I think we should move forward to Michael's lecture and hopefully Daphna can join us and finish her presentation afterwards. Thank you. Okay, Michael, great. take it away. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so just bear with me while I share my screen. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed uh, so far all of the presentations. And I think on some level, uh, hopefully, I'm not going to be convincing anyone of this uh, that's either a panelist or um, uh, or joining us uh, as an attendee, but I still think it's important to reiterate, uh, as Howard was actually talking about uh, during his uh, discussion, that density is something we need to continue to defend, particularly uh, in the United States. And I'll also certainly be interested in uh, the Israeli perspective if there's the kind of cultural, um, I would say, aversion to density that we, some of us have um, in America. But one of the key issues here, and, and, and like I said, I'm not gonna shine a new light on anything, but I do think it's important to put a bright light on some important attributes of density that we sometimes forget in the discussion of public health um, and safety and our own uh, you know, sense of you know, paranoia uh, when it comes to being near people. But um, some of the key issues that we really need to deal with or begin to think about is just you know global trends that are just not stopping anytime soon, and this idea that that you know we can de-densify and somehow accommodate uh, populations is is um, not just uh, tone deaf; it's just unrealistic. As as everyone probably knows, there's been this, this tipping point of urban to rural populations uh, across the world. That right now, 55 percent. Uh, of the population lives in cities, it's gonna to grow to 70%. Uh, and it's happening across the globe at different countries at different rates with you know, so certainly Japan leading the charge in the United States um, quickly behind that. Uh, and as a point of fact, you know, it's been about a hundred years in America since we were an urban population. So you think about you know, in, in, in 2020, we're a majority urban population across the world. In 1920, the United States became uh, majority urban population, but that is quickly changing uh, as uh, as the world urbanizes. Before I go too much deeper, um, uh, there's three key numbers that I think it's important for us to, to understand that, that give, I think, uh, importance to the issue of density. Uh, you know, that 40% of the population around the world today live near coastlines and waterways. We're going to add about 2.5 billion people to cities across around the world in the next generation. That's almost the same number of people who are in cities today. So imagine nearly doubling uh, the number of people in cities. And then with regard to climate change and our you know, species 
impact on the environment um, in develop and granted in developed nations. Um, so this is not talking about the developing world, but in developed nations, urban residents have about 70% less impact on the environment, whether it's GHG, uh, commuting, using public transport, living in smaller homes, as, as many of us have already discussed. So these are kind of key metrics when it comes to thinking about climate change and population growth and cities and density as one of multiple solutions to the problem of addressing the existential crisis of, of climate change. So pulling back, and, and uh, I'm, not, I'm one of the non-academics uh, uh, at the symposium today, but I did uh, have the pleasure of teaching a course with Sharon this past fall uh, on urban systems. So I've kind of gleaned some of these ideas from that uh, semester long course to our new urban technology uh, uh, students. Uh, so we kind of beg a big picture question of what makes a city, what defines it? Um, two key issues, there are multiple issues of, uh, of course and attributes, but two key issues of connectivity uh, and density and connectivity is you know physical, virtual and social connectivity. Density is a key question that we like to think about, like what is this tipping point that makes a place urban or makes a population uh, urban? And this is a, a a project by a former student of mine from Cooper Union who actually looked at this issue of density and connectivity. He, some of you may know that we were composed of five boroughs in New York City um, that are just historical in, in terms of their borders. But he basically, and his company Topos.ai, you know, basically created cultural boroughs. So kind of reshifted the five boroughs to reflect kind of the cultural and social connections that. Uh, defined the density rather than purely the historical boundaries. And you could see where there are certain kind of cultural connections or similarities between outer Queens and Staten Island, uh, parts of kind of uh, Northern Brooklyn and, you know, uh, the Upper West Side of Manhattan had more similarities than uh, their particular distance has. So this is a, you know, unique lens in terms of looking at these issues of density of people and the cultural connections that uh, really bind them together that you know the geospatial uh, differentiation between people is not necessarily the most important um, attribute but given new technologies you know having these social connections actually begins to transcend some of the geographic distinctions between them so pulling back a bit further um, basic questions of why density is important. Um, there's at least four reasons, there's probably 400, uh, but just dwelling on a couple of them. One, you know, density is, you know, promotes innovation, technology, and ideas. It, it is a way of spurring innovation uh, and thinking differently. Uh, it also promotes diversity and tolerance in a way that is, you know, statistically proven in terms of being around people makes you think differently uh, about the differences between us. It's also, as a practical level, able to absorb population growth and managing resource depletion, as we said earlier, in terms of what urban residents impact on the environment is. And that is you know, one important way of mitigating some of the climate change. Uh, pulling back a bit, um, here in the United States, we have this tension, I think, between density uh, and our, our society. This actually goes back to the, the country's founding. One of our founders, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the planners in the group may uh, recognize the image on the right, but viewed America as a, as a continent of grids of kind of agrarian farmers who are all separated by acres and acres of farmland and had a very particular distaste for uh, density and kind of mob rule. But, the, but unbelievably, this was also reiterated a year ago by, and this is an unfair comparison, of course, in March of 2020, but the fact that our politicians today talk about the density as something that's destructive, as um, Howard pointed out, you know, some of the, the densest neighborhoods in New York, like the Upper East Side, had some of the lowest COVID rates. So it actually is these underlying social issues of inequity and poverty that actually were the underlying causes rather than density. Uh, and if you just look around the world, many of the densest places on earth had some of the lowest COVID rates uh, in Southeast Asia as a proof point that density itself is not the cause uh, of, of the spread of COVID. Because it is a distinction between density and congestion, you know, the intensity of the use rather than the density uh, of the use, I think really is the key metric of understanding um, the difference between the two and the concept of choice, you know, being stuck in traffic, you have no choice to get anywhere, Someone would say that's congestion, not density, but choosing to live in a dense environment and all of the uh, ancillary benefits is, is a very different uh, question. 
So quickly around, you know, why this is important given our current uh, economy and, and the role of technology. But, you know, technology is uh, said earlier, making cities smarter, making people smarter, uh, but it also allows us to accept complexity in a different way uh, that there's this, uh, you know, an emergent city that we can begin to map in a way which is much more social uh, and much more dynamic. And we could actually see the metabolism of cities thanks to urban data in ways that we never have before. And this in many ways is a virtuous cycle of spurring innovation uh, and promoting a degree of communication and ecosystem engagement uh, that you're just not able to have in environments that don't have the density of uh, people and ideas and innovation that allows you know, an ecosystem to actually promote uh, innovation uh, and invention. There's also the notion of tolerance uh, and diversity that occurs in, in urban environments that is just much more challenging to create uh, in non-urban environments because you're just exposed to different perspectives uh, and it promotes a degree of empathy and tolerance that uh, non-dense environments don't uh, uh, aren't necessarily structured to do. And this is very much the work of Richard Florida, thinking about his three T's of economic development, uh, technology, talent, and tolerance is really the root of what the cities of the future are and the basis of the creative economy. And if you even look at something like his openness to experience by a uh, metropolitan region, you can see, you know, your openness actually is, you know, directly, uh, you know, correlated to your success in many ways as a city uh, or an urban environment. And then finally, with regard to climate change, again, I, I'm hoping I don't need to convince anyone here that climate change is real, uh, but there are dramatic impacts happening even in North America uh, with regard to rising sea levels and floods and heat waves and uh, more intense storms that are affecting population. Um, so there's going to be dramatic impacts in terms of both our agriculture, uh, but also our urban environments, which all, all tend to be in coastal areas. And the concept of migration, which you typically hear about in developing nations, is actually a real thing, even if you look at the kind of Katrina effect, uh, at the dispersion that happened, nearly like half a million people leaving New Orleans. Uh, so there's this migration is going to continue to occur. Uh, and uh, over the next generation, there are going to be winners and losers in the United States. And this is certainly not aligned with equity issues in particular. So some of the poorest um, areas of the country are going to have some of the hardest times when it comes to dealing with the impacts of heat um, and, uh, and flooding. So our urban systems approach basically looks at taking some of the data that was mentioned before uh, and thinking about the city, not just as a physical artifact, artifact, artifact but a container uh, of activities that we can measure like never before. Some of the work like Colorado of kind of measuring even something like uh, credit card transactions. Uh, so beginning to map cities in completely unique ways uh, as Mijin mentioned uh, in the opening, is transformative, but we do need to understand the privacy issues that Rit mentioned uh, earlier that uh, obviously get triggered. And then finally, in terms of the systems, which this is not a course, uh, but uh, there are multiple urban systems, both hard systems like uh, transport, water, infrastructure, and soft systems like social uh, and political systems and cultural systems. But finally, since we're talking about planning uh, and as an urban planner, I couldn't help to think about land use systems and how we could use land use planning uh, to avoid greenhouse gas emissions, to mitigate some of the uh, effects of climate change. And this is, you know, hopefully, as we say uh, in the US, mom, mom and apple pie here, a uh, comprehensive planner for denser, more livable cities. Uh, Transit-oriented development is really focused on building density around transport. Uh, and then thinking about and integrating climate change and adaptation priorities uh, into our planning uh, for the future. And then finally, one last note that's just very of the moment, at least here uh, in the US, I'm curious if my uh, Israeli colleagues are also seeing this, but this idea of a density does not have to be Seoul or Taipei. It could also be you know, a relatively mid to low rise dense city, but it's about choice. If you look at you know, of course, Paris and Anne Hidalgo's push to have, you know, the 15 minute city where it's about a diversity of land uses and options around, you know, a dense environment. In many ways, that's a great model for the future. If we think about density, it doesn't have to be 100 story towers. Uh, that's not for everybody, but certainly who wouldn't mind living in Paris? Uh, uh, so we could think about, you know, density in terms of the intensity of uses and the diversity of choice. Uh, so I hope you all, you know, will join me in kind of defending density and um, look forward to the rest of the conversation with my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael.
And uh, my apologies again for screwing up the order and my apologies on behalf of Zoom to Daphna. Thank you so much for uh, uh, rejoining. Um, if you'd like to continue your talk. Okay, um, thank you, Jenny. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure as, as to where I uh, continue talking to myself. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Well, we can help you if you'd like to share your slides. Yeah, yeah I will in a minute, yes. Um, I, I, I finished talking about this application, but I'm not sure that you actually heard about it. Um, I think you might need to come back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe this. Um, okay, so this is um, an application we developed in collaboration with Dr. Sagid Aliot from J Information. Uh, a route planning model considering the use of experience through visual perception based on the DVA model. The model explores all possible routes between the origin and destination points defined by the user and filtered out unrealistic routes. To demonstrate the model, we created a virtual model where the colors represent the schematic parameter for the spatial attributes such as low rise, high rise, prominent landmarks, commercial, uh, activities, parks, and trees. And uh, here you can see um, the routes representing different experiences, such as associated with uh, different user profiles. Uh, and as an example, these uh, two tourist oriented paths, where you can see one tourist is um, going longer, he has a longer path uh, lo looking for more experience as a tourist. And um, another example for uh, a more relaxing path in Manhattan where it's more vegetation oriented and um, uh, low density oriented. I mean, in Manhattan, low density in Manhattan. Um, so the difference between visibility analysis teams from the length of each route and distribution of the scenic attributes. The mixture of colors, the relative weights, magnitude, and frequency are indicating the relevance of each route to a specific user or experience. So we plan to elaborate on this application in the future. And another analytical model currently developed in our lab is the dynamic enclosure street section analysis, the DESA. It explores the height width ratio of each edge along the route um, a comfortable enclosure ratio was defined by Alexander Jacobs and Ewing as between one to two to three to two. So our model could help recognize better streets for pedestrians. Now we looked at three case studies in New York, the 10th Avenue, 5th Avenue and Astoria in Queens. And as you can see, Hell's Kitchen has a very comfortable enclosure ratio along mm -hmm. most of the route, well, the section that we looked at. Fifth Avenue has a small portion with uncomfortable uncomfort enclosure ratio. And uh, openness in Astoria is not considered as comfortable for urban pedestrians while well, relating to enclosure uh, parameter. And uh, information in depth will be presented in the conference next week uh, and in our upcoming uh, paper. The final section of my presentation will mention the recent experiments in VR studying the influence of variant spatial parameters on human well-being. In experiment one, we studied the influence of densification rates together with greenery and commercial uses on the well-being of uh, subjects for uh, existing case study in Tel Aviv. Density rates were from an existing density rate up to six times the original density. So density and presence of vegetation and or commerce had significant positive impact on well-being. The threshold was four times the existing density. Experiment two focused on the impact of morphology and uh, the rate of decomposition of the built form in a fixed density level. One of the main outcomes was that the sense of well being is higher in the environments with small, medium volume composition. And details can be found in our conference papers. The upcoming experiment was developed on an online platform due to the COVID 19. 
It is focusing on the influence of street section ratio and activity on well-being. And we hope that an online platform will enable an international and a much wider participation and perhaps with all you guys. Uh, so to summarize, we will recommend planning and design principles on, um, based on these experiment results and use this for developing a model for automatic generation of built environments. We will explore the relations uh, of experiments results with the DVA and DESA quantified results and update our models and use the data for optimization of the generative design model. So in this talk, I presented our DVA and DESA models, model assessment, uh, possible application and experiments in VR. And the combination of both models uh, could offer an in-depth understanding of perception of well-being based on quantitative analysis. Uh, we tried, I tried to show uh, many case studies around the world. And since we're talking in, we're now in New York. Uh, so you see that we tried to uh, also show uh, some of our work that related to Manhattan. Um, and we see these models as having a potential to contribute to the planning and design processes of su sustainable current and future cities, promoting new pedestrianism, well-being, and walkability. And thank you. And I'm so sorry that I somehow had to uh, fly away in the middle. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, um, I see some interesting discussion already. Uh, fomenting within the Q&A box, uh, but we'll come back to that. Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Robert, or Bob, as I know him, Balder, who is the Executive Director of Cornell University's College, College of Architecture, Art, and Planning in New York City, now known as the Gensler Family AAP New York City Center. Um, he served in this capacity since 2011, um, and Bob oversees the administration of academic programming in the city for the college's three departments. In addition, he teaches courses on city planning and urban design, as well as professional practice for planners. His research focuses on the transformation of New York City's waterfront and initiatives to create resilient communities. Um, please join me in silently welcoming Bob. Great, thanks Jenny. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, the screen's good, you can see everything? Great, thank you. Um, today I'm gonna to share a little bit of, um, of, a, of a past project that I've done in our uh, graduate urban uh, planning workshop. And uh, the talk is equity in planning, the study of green infrastructure uh, and the Bronx River. And as a little introduction for those of you that know Cornell University and the Department of City and Regional Planning, equity or what we have historically also called participatory planning has been at the core of our teaching for at least four decades. And I've been fortunate to have been highly influenced by the professors, uh, John Forrester, Pierre, Pierre Clavel, as well as Ken Reardon. And of course, some of our distinguished alums like Norman Krumholtz and his visionary work in the city of Cleveland. Um, their influence on my career has led to the work that I'm going to share with you today. And lastly, I'd like to dedicate this talk to the late Professor Robert F. Young, a colleague of mine uh, who sadly we lost a few years ago, but his commitment to equity, justice, and the environment inspired me to come to Cornell over 35 years ago. So let us begin. Let me get this. Um, I thought as an urban planner and for the group of, of diverse uh, participants today, I thought I'd like to restate uh, the essence of equity really as defined by the American Planning Association. Uh, and that is really planning for equity is intended to challenge those planning practices that result in policies, programs, and regulations that disproportionately impact and stymie the progress of certain segments of the population more than others. Done with intention, in, intention Equity is a thread that is woven through the fabric of all plans, regulations, developments, and policy options. And today I'm going to share with you a little bit of, the, of our approach to planning education here in New York City. And it's really through the lens of work that we've done by formulating a way for our students, uh, both in Ithaca, but also in New York City, to really have an opportunity to work closely uh, with various community groups, 
Uh, we've been doing now over 30 of these here in New York City each fall. Um, and those workshops really have a partnership or community-based focus. They are student-directed, meaning our graduate students are really able to shape and, and move forward on, a, on their programming. It's fieldwork-based, research and analysis-driven, but we also have to achieve all of that in just one semester. And the goal is that we actually have an actionable result, meaning our final recommendations, conclusions, whatever may come out of that, we do want that to really be seen through the lens of uh, directly benefiting our, our uh, essentially community members. Um, these are typically small teams, uh, sometimes very diverse with planners, urban designers, landscape architects, and occasionally architects. And we've also had a chance to work with a very diverse range of uh, both not-for-profits that are extensively involved in the public realm, uh, as well as thinking about other forms of transportation, uh, land use, but also uh, business improvement districts, and then of course, a whole range of city agencies that we've had a chance to collaborate with. Um, today, I wanna to share with you uh, the work that we've done. Uh, this was back in 2018 with a small group of graduate students um, one who is a dual degree landscape and urban planning, and the other really focused on traditional city planning. Um, this was work that was done on behalf of the Bronx River Alliance, and specifically looking at the Bronx River, uh, which is our only freshwater river in New York City and runs eight miles right through the heart of the Bronx. And the river has a long history as an important natural asset and was once the central location for members of the Mohegan tribe of Native Americans who lived, fished, and hunted along it. Uh, but unfortunately, by the late, uh, essentially by the late 1800s, much of the area had been redeveloped, uh, especially with the construction of the New York Central Railroad, which really was a turning point that led to uh, an enormous amount of pollution and industrial development, which essentially um, uh, rendered much of the uh, river corridor uh, off limits and uh, of course became a repository for waste and pollution. Um, but since the 1970s, community groups, public agencies, businesses and local residents have all worked together uh, as part of a powerful coalition to restore the river's conditions and improve public access to the waterfront and of course it's green spaces. Uh, and we will talk a little bit about some of the parks that are adjacent to it. Uh, but the decades of advocacy work um, by these community groups has led to the founding of the Bronx River Alliance in 2001. And today that work continues with the restoration, uh, which is really focusing on both uh, flood mitigation, reducing pollution, uh, as well as creating quality open space along the river. Um, so in this case, um, this was once, of course, a vibrant uh, river corridor. You can see some of the images here of the wetland ecology, as well as uh, the, um, the fact that this water body uh, represented really an enormous public resource, which um, unfortunately due to transportation, both uh, the railroad, but also uh, part of the Bronx River corridor was built out for a highway. Uh, much of the access to the waterway was uh, entirely constrained. On top of that, uh, we are talking about uh, essentially seven community districts that are adjacent to the river, uh, many of which represent uh, some of the most distressed communities in all of New York City uh, in terms of poverty rates, unemployment, uh, avoidable asthma, as well as other burdens in terms of affordable housing. So um, when you look at these diagrams, uh, you can really start to see in terms of the level of poverty that's here, uh, unemployment, health outcomes, as well as just lack of access to, to uh, food and other core services. There are many, many problems in this corridor. And of course, uh, the opportunity to actually restore access to the waterfront is definitely part of a response to the obesity rates, as well as some of the poor other health outcomes associated with this area. Uh, so the students also had a chance uh, we were invited in to work with the Bronx River Alliance to really look at uh, critical community needs based on some of the uh, documentation done by the city, as well as through some of the uh, direct interviews, working with various community leaders. We were able to start to identify some of the critical leading uh, indices of need across all seven community districts. Um, on top of that, we really focused on a community engagement process that really looked at the broad range of both planning, decision-making, 
opportunities for education and increased communication, but then also the idea uh, and one of the core elements of this work was to really think about the introduction of green infrastructure that could then start to filter a lot of the urban runoff that has so plagued this water course. Um, and that way we actually uh, have come up with a variety of ideas around do-it-yourself infrastructure in the form of new community-based green infrastructure that would hopefully uh, once implemented, be able to look at ways to improve water quality and the restoration of the Bronx River. On top of that, um, much of the work that the students did was also focusing on thinking about community facilities and other organizations that could be integrated into a broader coalition of support for the restoration of the river, as well as new opportunities for both uh, education, uh, student engagement, as well as looking at even opportunities for new employment. Um, of the approaches for green infrastructure, we looked at an entire array of different techniques that would allow us to be able to uh, scale these from something that the city could initiate through say the parks department or the department of design and construction, but even things that were much more manageable that would allow us to be able to think about lower do it yourself, low tech approaches to being able to introduce things like rain gardens, bioswales, uh, this particular array of options are more customary to what the city through the Department of Environmental Protection, DOT, and others have been able to implement. Um, in this particular opportunity, the students really had a chance to spend uh, field time really documenting local conditions, points of interest along the Bronx River, but also looking at points of, of um, access where uh, the community could start to really build uh, a nexus of engagement and opportunities for education, as well as passive and active recreation. Uh, beyond that, the students also had a chance to do quite a bit of mapping to understand the constraints along the river, uh, both from past engineering activities that channelized and straightened the river, but also looking at some of the issues of our built environment, especially the combined sewer overflows, where uh, much of our older generation of infrastructure, where we combine storm water with sanitary water, uh, have led to some major problems in this particular river body, but also looking at uh, the road and parkway and the rail network that have also limited access throughout the entire stretch of this eight mile corridor. On top of that, they also had a chance to map out and look for um, areas that are, are entirely eliminated that create barriers or points of access that could be enhanced. Um, beyond that, they also summarize some of the critical issues that we see with climate change, increased flooding, urban runoff, as well as just uh, degradation of water quality based on historical, industrial, and manufacturing uses in the corridor. Um, and of course, this also speaks to some of the built environment aspects of major construction projects that are planned in the area, um, as well as um, a lot of constraints in terms of uh, stormwater that then overrides much of our um, wastewater treatment system, and then of course ends up in the Bronx River. Um, They've also had a chance to do quite a bit of mapping, looking at uh, data sets, really understanding land use and the transformation of some of these neighborhoods, but also had a chance to look at uh, really the most important relevant uh, New York City policies dealing with green infrastructure, storm water, as well as other aspects of um, uh, working with the community and thinking about some of the restoration goals for the entire river corridor, including uh, the waters to the north in Westchester County. Um, through that analysis, the students were also able to create a number of very detailed maps looking at topography, looking at uh, sections, understanding uh, some of the profiles that would lead to areas that really need to be targeted for green infrastructure, as well as looking at the incidence of exposed bedrock, which is a, a unique uh, aspect of the Bronx terrain are these areas where bedrock emerges and also present enormous challenges for the integration of green infrastructure where you have bedrock and little or no permeability do present really enormous engineering challenges to the success of some of the initiatives. The students also had a chance to document, look at soil types, as well as looking at some of the precipitation issues in New York City, as well as runoff flows, and also starting to document through um, GIS 
and field observations, they were also able to start to look at issues around permeability, as well as uh, past development practices that have led to a lot of hard surfaces, large parking lots, as well as uh, just lack of permeability as a matter of our, of our built environment. Um, and also mapping and looking at our combined sewer overflows and understanding where some of these peak events are occurring, especially looking at major watersheds where we know we have high incidence. You can see in here where um, some of those hotspots are occurring and of course have led us to look at some of the opportunities for interventions. Um, the students also did and uh, based on a lot of collaborative uh, sharing of information, we were able to connect uh, with the city of Philadelphia and looking at some of their core initiatives with the idea of uh, harnessing key lessons for the Bronx River Alliance. We also were able to speak and work with some of the folks in Minneapolis to look at what they've been doing. And then lastly, also in Pittsburgh, looking at some of their innovation at being able to integrate community engagement and new infrastructure. And then lastly, I just want to share with you a little bit of the insights of how they approach the Starlight Park, which is at the northern end of the Bronx, uh, owned and operated by the New York City Parks Department. Uh, but essentially represents a really important opportunity for the students to follow these principles, which was really to think about a way of working with the community in a coordinated fashion with the idea of looking at interventions and educational opportunities that would then allow for new precedent of green infrastructure, as well as enhanced opportunity to partner with community, as well as the prospect of workforce development. And then finally, given past environmental issues, uh, the idea of actually doing restorative work that would speak to the idea of the environmental justice goals in the Bronx. Um, this just gives you a sense of some of the analytical work and some of the criti uh, critical thinking that the students presented in evaluating the site, but then also looking at past green infrastructure, some of which has survived, but much of which has failed. Um, and then finally, uh, identifying and working with the community to uh, locate six areas of what we consider to be do-it-yourself green infrastructure. Uh, and with great participation from the Parks Department, the Bronx River Alliance is really looking at the opportunity of training local uh, community members to actually do this in partnership and do it in a way that would allow it to be scalable and uh, something that could be monitored over time. Um, on top of that, uh, the Bronx River Alliance has been doing a lot of citizen science doing water quality testing with other organizations to really think about environmental monitoring as part of the data set will, that will really allow us to measure the results of these kinds of interventions. And finally, um, this is just some of the uh, areas of proposal where the students came up with a number of recommendations, including thinking about plant types, thinking about uh, different soil conditions, light regimes, as well as thinking about uh, the kinds of engagements within the community that could really allow for the fostering of a sense of, of um, ownership and uh, self-possession that uh, is something that is really um, quite honored in the Bronx. And on top of that, looking at opportunities for signage in the form of being able to really educate people about what's happening, as well as thinking more broadly about the broader environmental impact of thinking about um, uh, climate change, as well as thinking about opportunities for signage, wayfinding, and community engagement overall. So I will leave it there, but I just wanted to highlight just in terms of thinking about our role in this, um, I really believe that uh, improving the capacity of planners to advance social equity is one of the defining issues of our time. And the struggle with social equity is nuanced and varied. Um, and of course, a one size fits all solution will not correct, nor can our technology be viewed as a quick fix. So I look forward to Cornell partnering uh, with those that are on the call today to strengthen and continue to educate planners uh, by creating awareness about social equity and the approaches to advance it. So thank you for listening and a special thank you to Sharon for bringing us all together and a special thanks. I was able to um, uh, co-teach an urban design strategies course with her this spring, which was uh, I think extraordinarily effective and one that I, I am grateful to you, Sharon, for all that you've done. So I'll uh, leave it there for any questions and comments. Thank you so much, Bob. I think you would make your professors and Robert Young very proud. And I wish I'd thought to do the beautiful dedication. If I'd done so, I would dedicate it to Susan Christofferson, who we lost a few years ago, and John Reps, who we lost 
since uh, since last year. So um, I would like to introduce now uh, Professor Aaron Sprecher, who is um, Associate Professor and Chair of the Landscape Architecture Department at the Technion Faculty of Architecture and Town Planning. He directs the Material Topology Research Laboratory at the Faculty of Architecture. He's co-founder and partner of the award-winning practice open source architecture. Um, I have a long list of accolades here. He's certainly going to also expand uh, the geographies of, of what we're speaking about. So uh, please welcome again silently, um, Professor Sprecher. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Um, uh, I, you know, I also would like to join everyone, uh, you know, thanking uh, Sharon, the team, uh, for organizing this very inspiring um, uh, gathering. Um, and, I, and indeed, I think that the topics uh, that are being uh, addressed are today really essential to us and to our communities, for sure. So what I will do is that I have prepared uh, a paper that is uh, divided in two parts. The first part is more about a, a certain theory that I have about information technology, and I think it's important also to frame what do we mean by critical technologies. And the second part is more of an illustration of, of, of that uh, theoretical uh, standpoint, and uh, it will be an illustration through projects from students uh, that we have here at the Faculty of Architecture, because after all, you know, this is also a trans institutional uh, conference, and I think it's important to also have the students like Bob, you did so well, uh, uh, to have also the work of the students um, uh, represented in what we are doing. So uh, let me share with you my screen. Once again, here we go. Very good. Okay. So um, I would like to start by um, going back to a moment that was uh, very interesting and important in an international forum of experts in Geneva that is taking place every year. It's a very important forum, uh, especially in the French-speaking countries, uh, and it brings together uh, uh, top scientists and philosophers to discuss uh, the future of technology. And in the one that I'm referring to was actually the 39 uh, gathering of that, uh, of that panel of experts. It was in 2003. And um, at that gathering, scientists uh, questioned the limits of the human and more precisely the relation of the human with the environment in the age of information. Uh, here we go. Among the, the participants, um, the French philosopher Michel Serre, who passed away just a, a, a few months ago and who was actually a major um, uh, faculty member of Stanford University, the first of Michel Serre proposed a model of knowledge based on our technological capability to gather, associate, and connect information. The human ability to stream and screen information has prompted an exponential development of technologies that projects man uh, to the origins of life, as well as propelling a future built upon evolutionary processes that are, according to Serre, increasingly fast. The emergence of new sciences based on the nature of information, such as ur urban informatics, and we've seen just some examples now, has in fact accelerated our evolution and, uh, and adaptation. Compared to the long and patient evolution of nature, Michel Serre points out that technology has intensified time to the limits of human comprehension. He sees technology as a function of intensity, the intensity that we have now to memorize and associate pieces of information that are collected at all scales of reality. At that panel, the French biologist Henri Atlan talked about uh, and addressed this model, but he looked more into the question of our perception of the world and the transformation that we are producing in that, in that perception and especially in the representation. And in that sense, you know, that notion of mapping, I think is also very important. For Atlan, in fact, it is a matter of defining the limits between the human and the environment. And these limits are increasingly blurred by the mechanical character of information that is reported across nature. In this model, the human being is no longer idealized and limited to a particular terrain, but instead 
the human is more than ever connected to the world while acknowledging common traces, genetic or molecular, that we would have with the rest of the world and the environment. For Henri Atlan, information has in fact erased the limits and rendered a reality in constant extension. In, re in response to Michel Serre's model of intensified evolution and Henri Atlan's notion of extensity, the scientist Roland Ness observes that our reality is rooted in a series of laws that are, after all, limited in numbers and yet tremendously condensed in terms of information. And so with the exponential development of technology, the laws have generated models that combine both intensive and extensive sets of operations. The nature of these laws and mechanisms express potentials, potentialities, for the unfolding of dynamic processes that would take place in our environment, in our cities, like here on Tahrir Square in 2011, in the heart of the Arab uprising, a result of the tremendous amount of operations that were happening at that time on social media. Aaron, I'm really sorry. I think we're not seeing your slides. I think we're just looking at you. Ah. Oh, you don't see my slides. I think we just see your PowerPoint. Yeah, that is. Ah, true. that's strange. Wait a second. Let me just see. That's unfortunate because the pictures are really nice, actually. <laughs> this is why I'm interrupting. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you do the right thing. Wait one second. So, wait we a second. Don't, we don't show it as a full screen. You need to move to a full screen. Yeah, yeah, but I'm on a full screen. But here, like this, you see. You see something, no? You should just close no, it. And, we ju and we just see the title it. slide. Okay, okay. So just stay stay online. I will try to do something here that is strange. We we'll try to make it. Here we go. So let me just see. Would you see now a full screen or not? No, not yet. One second. I will I will share again my screen once again. You need to share a different part of your screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's what well, now we're looking at potentiality. Okay, very good. Right, right. So just before, just just because I think that the pictures, they, they, they say a lot uh, on, on, you know, on this uh, discourse. That was about intensity and the intensity of information in the city, the extensity that we uh, uh, experience in terms of technology and the environment. And here, that notion of potentiality that I think is very important when it comes to those urban phenomena that we're experiencing in uh, uh, the past decade. Now, now you see uh, the screen, I think it should, it should work, but this is for me really, you know, the formula. While these three conditions of intensity, extensity, and potentiality have shaped our technological environment since the post-war, the expression has never been so acute then in recent that we're seeing the thing that you want us to see. Ah, when it's not working, you don't see potentially. I, I still see uh, Tahir Square, but then um, Sharon says she sees a, a black screen. Is that, are we off? I see the same thing. It's the presentation, but not in presentation mode. This is strange. You need to, to push the button. So look at the right hand side. Exactly. Let me just check because here I should have. So now I guess that you should be able to see. One second, I will stop sharing and I will share again. Let's just see. This is unfortunate. And so now you see the lines. It looks like I have a problem with the Zoom. Um, do you see uh, my screen or not? No? Right. Yes, right. but look, the look, look down, do, down on the right. Yeah. The button I, for the yeah, yeah, well, I, I, know, I know about those things, uh, uh, Daphna, but I think that the problem is that really it's about uh, the screen sharing that seems to have an issue. Never yeah. mind, but now you can you can continue. Oh, now we can see the map. Yeah, you see you see that the thing I can just continue like this then. Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. All right. So while well, these three conditions of intensity, extensity, and potentiality have shaped our technological environment since the post-war, 
their expression has never been so acute than in recent months. In the past year, the world in many ways got reduced to statistics related to the spread of a worldwide disease. Beyond the fact that it revealed an extraordinary representation of such intensity and extensity of information, these statistics express the necessity to consider global phenomena, including climate change, resource scarcity, etc., in relation to their local impact in our human communities. So bridging the global and the local means that it becomes untenable to consider notions of environmental sustainability without considering other aspects related to the human communities, such as what I find really important and what we call the cultural sustainability. So recognizing such a multi-scale and multifaceted model of sustainability has never been so obvious than during our confrontation with the extreme nature of the recent global pandemic. It is here proposed to consider such extreme conditions to envision speculative technologies as an expression or reaction to global phenomena and community needs. So what I will show you now, I mean, the, the, there was a whole presentation with effects of transitions, etc. but it looks like that nothing of that will work uh, today, but that's okay, I will just move through, uh, through the slides. What uh, I will show now is actually uh, some of those projects that have been developed uh, with a group of students uh, uh, here at the Faculty of, Ar uh, of Architecture in uh, a partnership with McGill University in Montreal. These projects that you will see on those creative te technologies were actually uh, developed in the context of what is called the Israeli Global Studio, that is a collaborative program that we initiated here at the Technion with McGill University some five years ago. The program considers the unique environmental conditions of the Canadian Great North, and in particular the future of urban settlements that were imported to the Arctic in the 1960s as part of Canada's plan to settle down First Nation communities and exploit the rich natural resources of their territories. These communities were until then fully autonomous and proficient in terms of navigating and exploiting the geography of the polar region. With the implementation of generic urban settlements and the access to the national educational system, First Nation communities had to treat their, their traditional knowledge and beliefs for a modern approach to the environment. I will still try to do this one because that's actually a very nice, interesting video. I'm not sure, do you see a video there or no? No video? Uh, that's, a, that's, that's unfortunate. Okay, so here in that, was what is supposed to be that picture, you would actually see a, a, a view on that city of Shefferville that um, is really an example of what happened to those First Nations in uh, the sub-Arctic and Arctic regions of Canada. Over there, they traded nomadism for sedentarism, hunting and fishing for supermarkets, traditional storytelling for formal history, all that in the lapse of barely two generations. These shifts form the premises of our vision for community-oriented approaches regarding the future of Arctic settlements that stand at the crossing of local cultures and global economies. So, what I wanted to do here in this video is that just to show you and to start this journey in the subarctic city of Shefferville, that is located in the east of Quebec. The city is led by an administrator designated by the Quebec government. Here at Shefferville, there is no election. Located in the territory of Inu and Naskapi communities, the city was created in 1954 to extract its rich resources of iron, largely exploited by the Indian company Tata today. Shefferville exemplifies the struggle between the opportunities offered by our global economy and the local necessities of native communities that remain deeply related to their natural environment. In the following project, and I will go through, I mean, that's just a, you know, a number of slides just to show you uh, uh, the scope of the project. In this project, two members of the global studio, Amit Sadiq and Kobi Laham, envisioned a vehicle that would allow native Inu to navigate the traditional landscape, providing them with the possibility to hunt, fish, and gather around the campfire that is the most basic yet fundamental sign of community settlements 
as the architecture theorist Rena Banham would put it. Here, the ski do that is the most conventional mode of transport in the region, combines the conditions of a Western-like living unit and the experiential dimension of the native cultures. It offers an alternative way for those communities to escape from, the, from those cities or more to create an extension from that modern life in those uh, urban settlements and to, in fact, reconnect with their environment, with their natural resources. Cities located in the subarctic and arctic regions of Canada have in common the highly dynamic conditions of their landscape and community growth. One example is the city of Iqaluit, that is the capital of the Inuit nation of Nunavut. Nunavut, and you have here a, a picture, again, that was a, a video that is supposed to show you the city of Iqaluit, but it's very interesting for you to see the landscape. Nunavut is larger than Europe and include the richest, the, the richest natural resources of Canada, including large deposits of gas, oil, gold, and lead, among others. The Nunavut population today is estimated to 35,000 people, and the city of Iqaluit is marked by a steady growth of 15%, bringing its population to 8,000 citizens. It's a very different notion of density than the one that Michael has been discussing previously. And yet, it's a capital. And like other Arctic urban settlements, its architecture and planning is largely based on the southern model of building distributions and roads. In the following project, Global Studio members Noah Gigi and Yarden Ella envisioned a speculative mode of building distribution that considers the instable climatic conditions of the Arctic. The project is based on retrofitting a snowblower that is the most common tool for intervening in the Arctic landscape. The operator receives instructions for distributing the snow into wind breakers. These instructions are communicated by satellite communication and stem from real-time climatic data such as wind speed and direction. And so this responsive topography reconsiders the notion of urban fabric as a dynamic system rather than an idealized typology. And you see here some of those experiments that the students have been producing uh, uh, regarding the retrofitting, again, of a very common tool that you can find in the Arctic. Now, with the global pandemic and the closure of international borders, this year, 2021 Global Studio team concentrated on the research and development of a unique virtual reality interface that offers us with the possibility to pursue our work with the local communities over there remotely. And this is actually a picture from uh, just a, a couple of days ago, as they are actually experimenting with this new platform that they are uh, programming. And the objective here is not only to communicate with our Canadian fellows, but foremost to define ways to share a wide range of information that is both visual, textual, and even affective. This idea of creating such a communication platform points to the fact that architects have always created their own tools to generate an architecture that reflects the state of knowledge of its society. Here, the virtual reality headset is seen as an interface capable of producing a shared environment among participants that are located in very different geographies, yet with a common objective that is to produce a community-orientated design. And now I would like to conclude by saying the following. The history of urban design and architecture includes countless objects that have been designed for one man, like the pyramids, or for thousands of people, like the amphitheater in Delphi. And I would argue that in the age of the Anthropocene, I would consider the inherent instability of our natural and human environments as a generative force. Here, the idealistic typologies of yesterday give place to topological systems in continuous transformations. These projects are part of a large collection of speculative technologies that were developed in the context of the Global Studio Program here at the Faculty of Architecture. And each of these projects promotes a community-orientated approach in the design of environments that stand to the crossing of global technologies and local identities, what I would call sensors, senses, and sentiment. Thank you.
And sorry, there were no effects in the, in the presentation. Thank you so much. Really fascinating presentation. Um, we only have about five minutes. Um, I did see that we have a few questions. At this point, they're all um, aimed or asked of Michael. Um, I see some questions from Anthony Townsend. Uh, really enjoyed your talk, Michael. Uh, Takarobi, nation of cities had some good bench benchmarks on the dwelling units per acre U.S. cities need to target. Curious what states, cities are making progress towards those targets. Also, whether we will see opportunities for more dense new towns in the exurbs as a result um, of the shift. Cul-de-sac in Tempe is one example, but it's brownfield in infill. And the other question actually was about the indicators that your students use in the map of um, neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, I answered uh, the, that, that second one uh, I'll take first. The, in the chat, I, I uh, put in a Medium article where you could look at the, it, it's hard for me to go into the criteria, but it was a combination of kind of the built environment and then kind of socioeconomic and cultural factors that kind of reshaped um, uh, the boroughs. But I, I'll, I put that in the Q&A, but I could also put it in the chat because it goes into much more depth than uh, I can. And um, Thanks, Anthony. I, uh, I, I enjoyed Vishan's uh, book. It, it is a good question of whether or not we're hitting any of the, the density goals. I mean, one kind of small bit over COVID, as I think some of you may know, and maybe the, our Israeli colleagues don't, but some of the, the there's been a lot of press, at least lately, about the exodus of people from um, you know New York City, but the, 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 the facts are actually people are leaving the city and going to the suburbs more than they are kind of moving into kind of rural America and two cities in America that have seen growth during COVID, which may or may not be an indicator of future trends are uh, Austin and Miami as people are leaving higher priced areas in either you know, kind of San Jose, uh, San Francisco area or the Northeast. So what's interesting to me about Miami and Austin, while they're very different from each other, they both have a lot of the kind of like Richard Florida characteristics of relatively dense, relatively liberal, very rel 